Welcome, everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for making it out to a service. I know that it is just beautiful out there, and there are probably a ton of things that you want to do outside, but I appreciate so much that you chose to make this service a part of your schedule and carve out some time to be here. So appreciate that. Also want to welcome those of you watching online from wherever you might be. Thanks for tuning in as well. And if you have not yet subscribed to our YouTube channel, be sure and do that and click on that little bell icon so you can be notified when new content is uploaded and just stay up to date with what's going on here at Access Church. So uh, if you are new here, if it's your first time or maybe your first time in a while, then we are in the middle of a series called Step by Step. And as we talked about, you know, kind of what's our goal in this series and what do we want each one of us to walk away with at the end of the five weeks of this series. It really was that we would discover the steps it takes to grow in a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. That no matter who we are, no matter what our background is, whether you're new to this whole Jesus thing or you've been a follower for, for decades, that we would discover how easy and how simple and, and how to make steps to grow closer to him. And we kicked off this whole series, we've been following this pattern all throughout with this idea, this principle, that what we do determines where we go. What you and I do will determine where we go. That's true financially, that's true relationally, that's true professionally, and this is true spiritually. That the decisions we make, the actions we take, the steps that we take will determine where we end up and how strong our relationship with God is. We've covered some great steps already. If you have not seen those messages, you need to go online and watch them. I know I tell you that every single time, but I really believe it. You need to go online and watch those messages. Now, just last week, Pastor Kevin, our lead, our lead pastor, gave us another step and another challenge, and that was that in order to grow in a relationship with God, we need to spend time with him. That just like we, we grow closer to other people through spending time, that same thing is true in our walk with God, that the more time we spend with him, the more we will get to know him. And he kind of wrapped up the whole thing by challenging each one of us <clears throat> all throughout this last week that we just had to set aside a portion of time every day and spend with God, 10, 15, 20 minutes. And I hope that you took him up on that challenge. I hope that you followed through and you know spent some time in the morning or at night or you drive to work, whatever, spending time with God. If you did that, I want to ask you a question, and don't, you don't need to answer out loud. I'm not going to have you raise your hands or tell the person next to you. Just, just think about this for a moment. If you chose to intentionally spend time with God last week, did you find it difficult to connect with him? If you chose to spend time with God, you're sitting there and you go, okay, here I am. Did you find it kind of a struggle to feel something? Do you find it kind of difficult to focus and like, God, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing here. Am I supposed to hear you? Or are you supposed to reveal something to me? Like, was it challenging for you to sense God's presence or to sense if he was leading you? And maybe not even just this past week, but if you've ever tried to spend time with God in the past, has it been a struggle? Has it been like, Ugh, I don't really know what I'm supposed to be doing. I don't know if I'm supposed to be getting something out of this. I know that in my life, I've been there. I've felt like that before in, my, in the past. There are even still times today in the season of life I'm in right now where I feel like, God, what's, what's going on? I know I'm supposed to be with you. I know that your presence is real, but, but how come I'm, not, I'm just not feeling anything? And I think if we're honest with ourselves, no matter who we are, again, whether this is your first time in a church, you're exploring if you really believe this whole Jesus thing, or if you've been coming for years, I think we can all admit that, I mean, can it sometimes be difficult to sense God, to connect with him, to have a meaningful experience with him? Here's the interesting thing about that, though. I think the, the foundational problem, the root cause, is something that we experience in other areas of life, and we're just fine with it. We deal with it subconsciously, almost on a daily basis. The same reason that we have trouble sometimes connecting with God is the same thing that we run up to in other areas of life. Let me give you an example, okay? Who here is a dog person? Like, you love dogs, okay? You, who buys their dogs Christmas presents and wraps them and puts them under the tree? Okay, who lets their dog sleep in their bed with them? Who puts your dog in your family pictures with your human children? Okay, 
Put your hands down. That's not me, okay? I am, yeah, whoo! I am not a dog person. Like, it would not hurt me one bit if I never saw another dog another day in my life, okay? And it's not that I hate dogs or I've got something against them. I just can't understand in my mind why you'd want to cuddle up next to a smelly, shedding animal that licks its own butt. That just doesn't make sense to me. I don't understand it. I don't get it. I don't get your thought process. But here, here's the deal. Here's what, here's what I want us to realize. I have friends and family who are dog people, and I can be intentional about spending time with them. I can go to their house. We can be in the same small group together. We can go out to dinner. Like, I can set aside time to spend with these people, and I still don't get it. I still don't get why y'all love your dogs so much. It's just not me. And no matter how much time I spend with dog people, that's just not in me. Regardless of the amount of time, I will never understand this attraction and this like, oh, come here, lick my face. Blah, gross. I don't get it. We are just different, right? We're different. And this is more than just dogs. How about football? I... I cannot wrap my mind around the fact that some of you are Packer fans. And listen, it, listen, I know you just want a big game. Calm down, okay? Listen, our quarterback played terrible, and the refs were your best players on the field, okay? So just don't get all high and mighty on me. Amen. Let's pray and go home. <sighs> but in spite of that game, in spite of any game, I cannot rationally understand why you would choose to put a foam block of cheese on your head like it's some sort of scare tactic for other teams. Like, like when they seem like, oh my gosh, sharp cheddar, run for the hills. Oh, I just don't get it. It doesn't make sense to me. And listen, it doesn't matter how much time I spend with Packers fans. I work with one of them now. And let me tell you, this week was rough, okay? It took a lot of Jesus in me to make it through this week. But no matter how much time I spend with Packers fans, I can't understand your cheesy fondue brains. There's just something different in us, right? We can, we can work together every day. We can go out to dinner. We can hang out. We can be best friends. But I will just never understand that something inside of you that makes you different and the something in me, you won't understand why I root for clearly a superior team. Okay, let's move on. <clears throat> just got to get it in there as much as I can. Listen, the same thing is true for Chevy people. You don't understand Ford people. If you're an Android user, you don't understand Apple people. If you're a Democrat, you don't understand Republicans. If you're a man, there's no way in the world to understand a woman. So, I mean, just like, you know, and not that it's better or worse or right or wrong. There's just something different, right? There's something different in each one of us that makes us unique. There's like a, a core to who we are that shapes our worldview and our personality and our, our principles and our values. And regardless of how much time you spend with someone, regardless of how close of a relationship you are with someone, there are just some things that nobody else will ever understand about us. There's something inside that makes us unique and makes us different. And in fact... The Apostle Paul writes about this very thing. He writes a letter to a group of friends, a group of believers in the city of Corinth. And this letter is very instructional, it's encouraging, it's challenging about how this church ought to act and how followers of Christ should live out their faith. But in the beginning of this letter, Paul writes about this very struggle that you and I deal with. He says this in 1 Corinthians 2, No one can know a person's thoughts except that person's own spirit. And we got this, don't we? Like, this is not new information. This is not a new revelation. We all understand this. Nobody can really understand us like us. If you're a parent or a grandparent, you've got kids or grandkids, have you ever tried to explain to them how much you love them? Like, you can be as intentional as you can be about spending time with them and talking to them. I try and tell my girls multiple times a day, I love you so much. You're so important to me. I care for you so much. And I, I mean, we can spend four hours every single day for the rest of our lives with our kids or our grandkids and remind them, I love you, I love you, I love you, I want you to know I love you. But we all know they're never really going to get it, will they? They're never going to understand the depth of our love. Why? Because no one can know a person's thoughts 
except that person's own spirits. That's something that's unique to us that only we can understand. And so Paul just kind of starts off with this and establishes, gets everybody on board. Yeah, yeah, we know that's true. And then what he writes next is, I think what many of us or some of us have either this past week or sometime in our past have struggled and come up against in our relationship with God and as we seek to try and know him. He adds to it and says this, that we can't know another person's thoughts and no one can know God's thoughts except God's own spirit. So that's good news. Here we are, you know, trying to, trying to get close to God, experience him, and no one can do it. So, all right, wait, would you, would you bow your heads and pray with me? Here we go. No, hey, in all seriousness, have you felt like this? I mean, have you felt like, God, it just, it just seems impossible to get to know you. I try, I was told to spend time with you, and so I did. Okay, I try, but I get nowhere. I carve out some time and I get nowhere and I, I want to understand you. I want to sense your presence. I want to know your direction, but be honest with yourself. Have you felt like this? Like, man, it doesn't seem like I get here. It doesn't seem like anybody can really know God. Seems like I'm just kind of sitting there waiting for something to happen and, and nothing happens. And I think what Paul writes here is a familiar, unfortunately, a familiar feeling for many of us as we learn to or as we walk through this journey with God and this relationship with him, sometimes it just feels like, man, is there something wrong with me? Is there something that I'm, I'm missing? Is How come I can't know God like I hear other people talk about it? And listen, this is a complex issue. There's a lot of facets to this, a lot of different steps that we can take. But what Paul writes next is, I think, a step An A step that some of us have either never taken before or A step that some of us have forgotten about the importance of it. And Paul says, no one can know God's thoughts except God's own spirit. And then he follows it up with this. And we have received God's spirit, not the world's spirit. Why? Why have we received? So that we can know the wonderful things God has freely given us. You see, it's through Jesus Christ that we have access to a relationship with our Heavenly Father, but it's through the Holy Spirit that we can experience God's presence in our lives. And I know that anytime we talk about the Holy Spirit, there's, there's a lot of questions. There's fear, there's uncertainty, there's some uneasiness, because my guess is if you've been around Christianity at all, then you've seen some weird people do some weird things in the name of the Holy Spirit. Some people abuse the Holy Spirit and blame just plain old weird actions on the Holy Spirit, but that's not what he's like. The Holy Spirit is is God. He is one of the three characters or individuals or persons of God. There's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. And as a culture, I think we're okay with God the Father. We, We can at least mentally understand that. And as a culture, I think we're pretty good with Jesus, at least kind of the nice feeding lamb social Jesus that we're presented with. We're okay with that. But when it comes to God, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, I think we tend to put on our brakes. We don't really understand what he's like. We don't understand his his role. We don't understand even who he is. The Holy Spirit is not Jesus' ghost. Jesus did not turn into the Holy Spirit when he left this earth. The Holy Spirit is not some mystical, enigmatic, just kind of energy force floating around. The Holy Spirit is God and has a very unique and special purpose, a role in our lives. And that purpose is to help us experience God and get to know him better. And as Paul writes to these, these friends of his in Corinth, he's, I mean, I, I, I see him in like, guys, we've, we've received the Spirit. We dealt with this before. We didn't know God, but but we've got the Holy Spirit in us now. We've received him, and you know what that means? It means we can know him. It means we don't have to wonder about what God's thoughts are. It means we don't have to wonder about what God thinks of us. We don't have to wonder about God's character. We don't have to question God's heart. We don't have to question his plans. We have the Holy Spirit in us, Paul says. And because of that, we can know him. And we can know him better than ever before. But this isn't just Paul's idea. Like, he didn't sit in a room one day and go like, you know what, I think I'm going to make something up. This was simply repeating what Jesus himself 
said about the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Look at some of the things Jesus said. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but will tell you what he has heard. That the Holy Spirit's role in our lives is to speak to us. Now, maybe not audibly. I've never heard the audible voice of God. But to speak or to impress or to reveal things about God to our very hearts. That he will speak God's love to us when we spend time with him. That he will speak God's character. That he will speak God's plan. That he will magnify our Heavenly Father in our hearts. That he will be our guide to guide us into all truth. I mean, imagine what an incredible gift it is to have a guide in our relationship with God. We're not just walking around willy-nilly trying to figure this thing out on our own. But the Holy Spirit's purpose is to guide us and to lead us and to direct us to our Heavenly Father. Look at what else Jesus says. He says, But when the Father sends the Advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I have told you. That the Holy Spirit is there to teach or help us connect the dots, per se, in understanding who God is. And, and he's there to remind us when, when we face doubts, when we face low times, when we face struggling times, when we wonder what's going on, the Holy Spirit is there to remind us of who our Heavenly Father is and what his kingdom is like and what his plans are in our life. It is incredible love for us. And, and Paul, when he writes to the Corinthian church, is just repeating what Jesus said decades earlier, just a few decades, that all of the things that Jesus taught about God, our Father, and about the kingdom, all of Jesus' promises to us about peace and joy and contentment and satisfaction and direction, all of that is available to us through the Holy Spirit. In fact, one of Jesus' most amazing statements, incredible statements, shocking statements that he ever said has to do with the Holy Spirit. And the setting was the Last Supper. He's gathered his closest followers around as he kind of finalizes everything that he's taught them for the past three years. As he, as he narrows it down to just, guys, remember this. And in that dinner setting, in that personal fellowship with one another, with his closest friends, he says something incredible about the Holy Spirit. Look at what Jesus says. But in fact, it is best for you Best for you that I go away. Because if I don't, the advocate won't come. The Holy Spirit won't come. But if I do go away, then I will send him to you. I want you to put yourself in the disciples' shoes for a minute, okay? Imagine. It's Passover. It's a very important, meaningful, kind of somber holiday for you as a Jewish person. And you're having dinner with your leader, with somebody who you've walked with for the past three years, and you have seen him do things that words can't even describe, you've seen him teach with such authority that it blows your mind, you've seen him stand up against the leaders of your land, from religious leaders to Roman leaders to people coming to get Jesus, just stands there with authority, that you've walked countless hundreds of miles with this guy, you've shared meal after meal, you've seen him do miracles that blew your mind, what an incredible leader. And you think that Jesus is going to be the political king. You think he's coming. He's starting a new government. You're going to be sitting high in the Senate or the cabinet or whatever. And then Jesus says, guys, listen, listen. It's better for you if I go. What? Like, no, 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 Jesus. I, I, if I was one of the disciples, I'd be like, mm, maybe just sit down. Don't, don't leave, okay? Turns out you're cool. Turns out I really like you. Turns out you got a lot of power. So how about you, how about you stay? I don't care what else is going to be. You just stay. Jesus, I want you. But Jesus says, no, 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 no. There's something better. There's something better for you in your relationship with God. Something better than me walking with you. And that's the Holy Spirit in you. And I just think that maybe for a lot of us, this is a step that we've missed as we pursue a growing relationship with God. Each and every week, we've been talking about steps we can take, decisions we can make, purposeful, intentional things we can do to grow in our relationship with him. And this week is no different. 
What we do determines where we go. Where we go in our relationship with God is, is one of the factors is this step of having the Holy Spirit be active in our lives. But here's the thing about that. When you and I put our faith in Jesus, when we trust him for our eternal salvation, the Holy Spirit already lives within us. He's there. But he's kind of, I mean, for lack of a better term, he's, he's just kind of dormant. He's just kind of like sitting on a couch inside, eating Cheetos, watching reruns of Full House. That's what the Holy Spirit is like. Because we need to take a step. We need to take some action in order for the Holy Spirit to fulfill his purpose in our life, you and I have to make a choice. And that choice, that step we need to take is to ask. To ask the Holy Spirit to be active, to move in our lives, to fill us from within. And we see this all throughout the historical narrative that's documented in the New Testament, especially in the book of Acts, The book of Acts is a a letter written by a man named Luke that describes how these ragtag bunch of believers with nothing special and no resources and no influence, how they changed the world and how the church of Jesus Christ grew. And all throughout the book of Acts, you can see where believers took this intentional step of asking the Holy Spirit to fill them. And it starts early on, all the way in chapter 8, chapter 2 before that, but in chapter 8, persecution has just kind of started in the church. It's, the, it's these new believers kind of first experience in dealing with people who want to stamp out Christianity. And Stephen was the first martyr for this new movement called The Way. They weren't even called Christians yet. They were just followers of The Way. And as persecution started to creep in, believers had to run for their lives. They couldn't stay in Jerusalem Anymore, There were people coming to arrest them, coming to take things from them, and coming to kill them. And so as believers literally ran for their lives to different parts, different areas, different regions, they brought the message of Jesus with them. They brought this message of the eternal significance of the death, burial, and resurrection of this man named Jesus. And one of those people was a man named Philip. And we can pick up the story in in Acts chapter 8. But now the people believed Philip's message of good news concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. And as a result, many men and women were baptized. That everywhere these new believers went, they talked about Jesus because this was new. This was was revolutionary. Never before had people heard of a God that would send his perfect son to die in place of imperfect people. And so droves of people are coming to Christ. Droves of people are accepting the message about who Jesus is. And we skip forward a couple verses, and Luke says, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that the people of Samaria had accepted God's message, they sent Peter and John there, that apparently there were so many people. This was such a big movement. Things were happening so incredibly. They kind of had to send in the big hitters, you know, the the OG crowd, Mm, represent. They sent Peter and John there. Listen, guys, we need some help. We need some help. There's too many people coming to Christ. What are we going to do with this? And so this is what Peter and John did. As soon as they arrived, they prayed for these new believers to receive the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the Holy Spirit hadn't come upon any of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They had only put in their faith in Christ. So Peter and John laid their hands upon these believers, and they received the Holy Spirit. Peter and John and these early believers, they knew that God had something more for them. They knew and they wanted to experience God more than they ever had before. And Peter and John knew, you guys got to ask the Holy Spirit to be active. You guys have to take a step and move beyond simply faith in Jesus. I mean, that's amazing. That's incredible. But there's so much more that is available when the Holy Spirit is active in our lives. And I just want to ask you, is that something you want? The choice is yours because this is is true, just like it's been true this whole series, that what we do determines where we go. Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit was better for us. 
the early believers discovered that the Holy Spirit enhanced their relationship with God. In my own life, I have found that through the working of the Holy Spirit in my life, that my relationship with God is deeper and stronger and more meaningful than it's ever been. But for you, what do you want? Where do you want to go in your relationship with God? Where do you want to see your relationship with God end up? Because here's the truth. If you are simply content with going to heaven when you die, and you don't need God in the meantime, then just believe Jesus. And I don't mean that to be sarcastic or condemning or anything. I'm trying to be as truthful and as honest as I can. If you don't need more of God right now, you just want to be sure that you're going to heaven when you die, Jesus is good. You don't need the Holy Spirit. Your salvation was purchased totally and completely by the death of Jesus on that cross and his resurrection. But if you want more, if you want to know God better, if when you spend time with God, you want it, you want it to be more meaningful, you want to know God's thoughts, you want to know God's heart, you want to know his character, you want him to reveal more of himself to you, then what you do is going to determine whether or not that happens. And the Holy Spirit is available to every single one of us. But I don't want anybody to make a rush decision. This is not some emotional sort of hype thing. It's not like that at all. And so what I've asked is for the band to simply lead us in a song. And I don't want you to worry about standing up. You don't have to sing along. I just want you to take a moment and just be still. And this will be a chance for us to practice what Pastor Kevin talked about last week, to just spend time with God. And as they lead us in this song, just think about the possibility of what the Holy Spirit might add to your relationship with God. Think about where you are right now and if you want to be further along and allow the words of this song to guide your thoughts. And then after they're done playing, I'll come back up and give you an opportunity. Have your way, Spirit come. I, uh, I hope that God is moving in your heart right now and drawing you to want to say those words and to make those true in your life. Holy Spirit, have your way. Come and fill me. There's only one prerequisite to being filled with the Holy Spirit, and that is putting our trust in Jesus Christ for our eternal salvation. That's it. Otherwise, he is open and available to any of us. And so what I want to do as we wrap up our time here today is give you an opportunity to ask, to take that step yourself right now, right here today, to ask the Holy Spirit, fill me, be active in me. But I want to do this in two different, two different ways. I want to split it up between two groups of people. I want to pray first for those of you that never have taken this step before. Maybe you've been coming for a while, maybe you've known Jesus for a while, but you've never made the commitment or, or made the ask for the Holy Spirit to fill you. I want to pray for you first. And then afterwards, I want to pray for anybody, even those of you watching online, anybody who wants to be filled again because there's no limit. It's not like we ask once and then we're done. In fact, I think it's a good daily practice for us to ask the Holy Spirit to fill us. And so what I want to do is just ask everybody to bow your heads just so we're not looking around. There's no spiritual reason for this, but just so we can focus better. And I want to first pray for those of you that this is going to be a day in your life where it's marked down, man. This is a day that my relationship with God grew because I asked the Holy Spirit to fill me. And what I want you to do is I want you to just raise your hand if that's you. And I want you to make eye contact with me. Nobody else is looking around, but I just want to see who I'm praying for. If you want to say, Holy Spirit, I want you in my life. I want you to fill me. If that's you, just pray along with me in your heart. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your incredible desire to be with me. And God, I know that I'm not good enough on my own to be with you. I thank you for sending your son Jesus to die in my place, to bear the weight of my sin, to die in my place so that I could be made right with you. 
Thank you for your sacrifice, Jesus. And now, God, I want to know you better. I want to be closer to you. And so, Holy Spirit, I invite you to be active in my life. Have your way in me. Fulfill your purpose in my life. I also want to give those of you a chance who have been filled before, but you want to renew that. You want to ask the Holy Spirit to fill you. Would you just raise your hand so I can see who you are? If you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit again today, it doesn't matter how many times you've done this in the past. That is awesome. I'm so excited and I'm so happy for you. You can, you can put your hands down. Would you just pray along with me in, in your heart? Holy Spirit, I invite you to be active again in my life. I want you to keep fulfilling your purpose in me. I want you to keep revealing more of my Heavenly Father's heart to me. Holy Spirit, make your home inside of me. I give you permission again today, Holy Spirit, to do what only you can do, to be my guide, to teach me, to remind me, to fill me in my relationship with God. Thank you for your willingness to move in me. And Father, I just pray for all of us. Wherever we are in our relationship with you, whatever steps we have or haven't taken, God, I pray that in your own special way, you would continue to draw us close to you, whether that's through the Holy Spirit, whether that's through relationships with other people, whether that's things that you just speak to our hearts in our own quiet time with you. Father, continue to draw us close to you. It's in your Son, Jesus' name, that we pray. Amen.